while they find their seats, we're going to discuss now, uh, up to our break, overcoming challenges surrounding cybersecurity and data protection. Of course, this is something that came up this morning, at least peripherally, and we talked a bit about um, what happens to the data, uh, and we touched slightly on what people think about the safety of cars and convincing people of the safety of autonomous cars and other vehicles indeed as, as well. And obviously this is going to have quite an, an impact on that. So, uh, Charlie, we're going to go down one, two, three, four again. Charlie, if I can get you to kick us off for just a couple of minutes setting out your stall on this subject. Sure, thank you. Um, so, as we've heard throughout the day, um, a key feature of cabs is the amount of data they generate. Um, and the fact that this data is going to need to be shared with third parties for commercial reasons and also for the vehicles to work effectively. Happily for lawyers like me, and I know there are various others dotted around the room, um, London's a bit like, uh, it's, it's the rat analogy, really, you're never too uh, far away from a lawyer. Um, this is generating complex legal and regulatory queries around the status of the data. So who, if anyone, owns it? What can you actually do with it? And who is liable for the misuse of the data? And in particular, and this is really close to my heart, given what I do for a day job as a kind of cybersecurity incident response lawyer, all of this data needs to be kept secure. We all know that a data breach or a cybersecurity incident involving CAVs is going to make for great headlines. It has already. Um, and we also all know the reputational damage, the financial loss, the litigation, the regulatory scrutiny that's going to flow from that and how crippling that can be. So, um, in terms of the legal and regulatory framework, um, under the laws of many jurisdictions in the EU, including the UK, um, much of the data emanating from CAVs is, is going to be considered to be personal data within the meaning of European data protection laws, meaning that people who collect and control and process that data are going to have to comply with laws on data protection, which, as many of you will know, are about to become stricter and more complex next year with the advent of the General Data Protection Regulation, which seems to be coming our way here, um, regardless of Brexit. Um, and data security, including cybersecurity, that's going to be a critical component of that compliance activity. Um, so organisations that control and process data have to take appropriate technical and organisational measures to ensure its security. And there is not much, if any, uh, regulatory guidance at the moment in the context of this sector and what we're looking at today as to what that means. Um, <coughs> Outside of the realm of data protection laws, um, and certainly in the UK and in many other jurisdictions as well, the, the laws and regulations governing cybersecurity in the context of what we're talking about today are, are still developing, they're playing catch up, they're largely piecemeal, pretty incoherent actually and hard to navigate. But I think we can expect this gradually to change. Um, as a starter for 10, we've got the EU's Network and Information Security Directive coming into force next year, which is going to impose cybersecurity compliance on certain organisations in this room, probably. Um, and it is going to gradually infiltrate through to, to others in the, uh, the supply chain as well. So I, I think the key messages from me for today are um, really uh, the risk of sounding trite. Just understand very clearly what data you might be collecting and processing in the um, CAV supply chain. Just ensure there are clear agreements in place governing the use of that data. If it's uh, personal data that's involved, make sure that you are GDPR ready and compliant. Really ensure that any data for which you're responsible is kept secure through state-of-the-art technological and organisational measures. Um, and plan for the worst. Um, rehearse your worst nightmare in relation to data because when the worst happens, it's always 8pm on a Friday night. That's not the time to start Googling the right people to, to support you. And if you get this right, um, there are huge commercial and innovation gains to be made. And it's really good for brand as well to be, uh, seem to be strong on data security. Mm, yeah, well, that last point is a very interesting one, isn't it? Which we'll get back to in a moment. But, Charlie, thank you. Uh, Mike Bors. Yeah. Hello. Um, as BMW, we can say we now have 8.5 million connected cars out there. And if you can imagine, there had no major safety and security incidents right now. So that means we are taking safety and security as well as data privacy um, um, very, very carefully. So, and we have all heard with all the AD technologies which are coming up, which Ian Robertson has said on, on the people from Intel, there are a lot of data which will be generated with automated vehicles. The question is, how do we trade or how could we deliver those data from the vehicle to a safe platform and maybe for, to third parties who want to make their services? 
And, and therefore, we in the automotive industry, at least in, in the German association and as well in the European association, we created a term like OEM extended vehicle back end, which we all are implementing now. That means we took the data from the vehicle, store it, all relevant data, store it to a web-based server, and all third parties could access to those vehicle-generated data over a safe and secure web-based server. That means that we as manufacturer are hosting that data cloud infrastructure and we will take care that the data from the vehicle to the backend is be transmitted in a safe and secure manner. That means we have to install end-to-end -end security systems between those GSM uh, transfer line and we will take care to the security of the transfer line because if we now um, sell a vehicle to the customer and the transfer line is safe and secure, we need constantly over the air security updates, then computing power is increasing rapidly and uh, this is the job of the manufacturer and therefore this is our, our um, model how we do see manufacturer can take over safety and security and as well liability of, of the customers. We have seen a lot of, um, of car hacks in the US, um, be it uh, the Chrysler hack and the Jeep hack. Those hacks had been performed by using an OBD dongle, a small device, electronic device, where you could put in on a standardized interface. And those are all vulnerabilities because those people who deliver those dongles to the customers are keen on getting the data on the cheapest way. And you can open up eBay, you will find dongles from five euro to 200 euro, and you can imagine that the security system behind those dongles is different. Mm. Okay, buy an expensive dongle is your key message. <laughs> <laughs> Never a bad message in any area of life. Andy. <laughs> Well, first, I'd like to thank the uh, SMMT for inviting uh, me here to talk to you on behalf of Halfords and Halfords Auto Centres. Um, what are we doing? Well, we're working to ensure that the aftermarket has a seat at the table in the world of the connected autonomous vehicle. And as a leading retailer of motoring products and MOT service and repair, we're monitoring closely the developments of the connected car and autonomous vehicle. In addition to quarterly SMMT, CAV Forum, we're pleased to give an aftermarket view as part of the Automotive Information Exchange. As a business with 416 stores and 318 garages, we are aiming to help create a level playing field for the consumer. For us, it's about ensuring that the consumer maintains a level of choice of where they have their vehicle service to maintain, but also to continue to benefit from the products and services of the aftermarket accessories. Access to vehicle data is a very important part of the level playing field, and the independent aftermarket must have access to this data, be it on the vehicle or cloud-based. However, pricing must be fair and reasonable. Vehicle manufacturers are increasingly integrating systems into the vehicle that will preempt repair needs. Alfreds believe consumers should have the right to choose, and whilst we accept vehicle manufacturers may integrate specific applications, the hardware on the vehicle should allow the consumer the choice to install uh, and utilise alternative apps. If, for example, part selection and vehicle maintenance is via the HMI, then the consumer must be free to choose alternatives to those suggested or pre-installed by the VM. And Halfords and other retailers must be able to offer their proposition through the same platform. It must remain possible for the consumer to plug in their vehicle to aftermarket equipment such as dash cams, sat nav, phone leads, telematics devices, without pre-approval by the VM under the guise of cyber security. This will restrict competition, free market innovation and consumer choice. In cyber security, we will shortly be working with one of our major suppliers on the use of a secure server, making it possible to upload electronic service records and making them available to stakeholders such as consumers, lease companies, insurers and VMs. The consumer will maintain the freedom of choice of vehicle servicing while their warranties will be upheld as their records can be made available securely. It's interesting listening earlier on about the, uh, the, the licensing situation for technicians, and it's something that we're very much uh, supportive of, and certainly you know, we're supporting Steve Nash and the IMI in, in trying to achieve that. 
Um, I could talk all day about technical training and what we're doing with our technicians, but I'll, I'll leave that till later if anybody wants to ask questions. But certainly we're, we're very much ensuring that as a business, our technicians are skilled and qualified to work on uh, electric hybrid vehicles. That's why we take them up to level two. Um, so I'd love to talk about that later as mm. and when. Yeah, okay, Andy, thank you. Sevi. Thank you. Um, so I think the, the value space in connectivity and data and automation is fairly well established, so I don't need to devote a lot of time to that. What's a lot more challenging and what is a lot less understood and what we're here to talk about today is the problem space. So the problem space for me, uh, in, certainly in terms of data, breaks down into three broad areas. There is an issue around security, there is data protection and privacy, uh, and there is competition and fair market access. So we're going to be talking about that a lot today, but um, just in terms of the security point, um, security is an area that uh, we have to get right in order to secure consumer trust in what is essentially an emerging technology. If consumers can't trust the technology, then we're going to struggle to generate a return on the investments that are currently being made in that technology. That is all part and parcel of having a well-functioning market for connected and automated vehicles. Um, so the problem there is that we have a bunch of risks that we currently aren't able to quantify. We've got vulnerabilities that we aren't able to pinpoint. And we have uh, potential liabilities that we're basically not aware of at the moment. So entering into this kind of relationship with the consumer where we offer automation and connectivity and services, we have to be clearer in our minds about what the risk looks like, what the agreement looks like. And it's very hard to do that because we've got complex supply chains. We could have risk parks somewhere deep within the supply chain that we aren't even able to quantify. So I think that's an area where a lot more needs to be done at this point in time. But the good news is that we're working on it. Um, so we're working very closely with, um, certainly from my perspective in government, um, in, with the uh, security agencies in the UK, so with CPNI, the new National Cyber Security Centre, um, we're engaging with industry through um, the uh, Automotive Information Exchange, which we've already talked about. Uh, and we are working towards painting a picture of what good looks like. Because one of the key things for, for us that came out of our policy development work in this space was that industry has to be given the latitude to innovate around this problem and not to be constrained early on. Um, we have an, a tremendous opportunity to get ahead of this, to get it right, to do security by design, to do, to do privacy by design. Uh, and it's not the right time to be going in heavy-handed and saying to industry, this is, we're going to own the problem with you and tell you how to do it. Um, so guidance is a good solution at the moment, but we have to kind of like do that at the right level. It's all well and good, the UK doing that, and we've kind of engaged with our agencies to produce... Uh, a set of high-level principles for the cybersecurity uh, of the CAV ecosystem, which we intend to publish in the next couple of months. But we're also working at UNECE at, at an international level on painting a world globally agreed view of what good looks like. And this may translate into requirements in time, but uh, at least giving industry that steer on what sort of things they should be thinking about early on uh, is really important for us. And finally, just to say on cybersecurity, it, it, there is so much more to life than cybersecurity. Uh, we have to think about, we have to think about, actually it's a bad thing, because we have to think about the whole ecosystem that these uh, products and services operate within, and all the organisations involved with them. And we have to think about personnel, we have to think about the organisational structures and governance structures and arrangements that are in place, and physical security, because it's all very well putting loads of effort into product security if uh, somebody is able to walk into a server uh, and um, download user data on a, on a dongle. Thank you. Yeah, and does that mean that what good looks like is there will be occasional hacks and quite newsworthy and damaging ones in the future and that, and that the brands and the companies just have to get used to it? Is it as simple as that, do you think? I, I, think, I think that there will be precedent-setting cases in the future, yeah. It's very difficult to achieve a residual level of risk of zero, but at the moment I think the risk level is very low and we have a great opportunity, as I say, to get ahead of it. Uh. Uh, when you listen to the Halfords view uh, and the aftermarket view more generally of what should be made available to them, are you comfortable with that? Um, yeah, we are comfortable with that. Um, if we make uh, the data transfer line in that um, uh, way, I, I um, said it before. So we are open. We will deliver on the data on a non-discriminatory basis. 
Uh, looking at the GDPR, um, the customer has the right to deliver his own data and to transfer it to him, uh, to whomever he, he wants to. And if the customer approaches at an independent aftermarket shop and says, I want to have my BMW car data delivered to this independent repairer and here's consent, we will deliver the data mm. to that aftermarket. You made a provider. distinction between right. personal data and, and the rest of the data. Yeah. I mean, if, say the data is about the, the degree of wear of the brakes on my car. Do I own that data in any sense? Should I be paid for it? What, how, how does that work? I guess if that data be, can be correlated with other data that identifies you, it becomes again personal data, and do you then have rights in relation to that data under data protection? Legislation? Is it is it clear to you how how the law is going to sort that out? That kind of um, it, it'll be about correlation. So yeah. truly anonymous data um, that can never be linked back to an individual, a living individual, that will fall outside the realm of uh, data protection laws. It doesn't mean it's not going to be potentially owned by somebody. It doesn't mean that people won't necessarily have rights over it. Well, then on other things like contract law or intellectual property rights. But it, you have to have that degree of correlation to a living individual. If you get back to that. Mm. And you were talking about licensing. I mean, it's obviously really important, isn't it, that, that everyone who has access to this stuff has some degree of, of, of responsibility. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, it's clear that um, right from the technician that works on the car that downloads the data or uploads the software, uh, to the uh, business owner has to be able to prove that they are uh, responsible um, and capable of securing that data and ensuring that it's held. held when there are when properly. there are infringements, how should it be dealt with? I think that can only be done through regulation. Do you think it's got to be regulation and, and punishments that are proportionate to the to the level? Is is that the way? That's the direction we're going. I guess it depends on the nature and severity of the incident. So talk the question slightly in typical legal fashion. Yeah. It, the um, major incidents involving misuse of personal data, for example, yeah, they're going to be uh, they're going to be sanctioned. They're going to be more heavily sanctioned, um, with effect from May next year when the new laws come into force. Um, but you have other infringements that actually never see the light of day because they're contained very effectively behind the scenes, um, and for whatever reason, a, a report to the regulator to the public doesn't need to be made. Yeah. So it really does depend. Yeah.